Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this virtual professional development opportunity hosted by the Maine Department of Education. My name is Joe Schmidt, and I'm the Social Studies Specialist for the department. Today, I'm excited to have back for not the first, not the second, but the third time so far this spring, the amazing Dr. Libby Bischoff from the University of Southern Maine. Uh, professor of History and the Executive Director of the Osher Map Library. She is here today to talk about bringing visual primary sources into the classroom. So we're talking visual disciplinary literacy today. Uh, and I have all the confidence in the world that Libby is going to be amazing for the third time this spring. So again, back by popular demand, Dr. Libby Bischoff from USM. Hi everybody, good morning. And thank you for bearing with me on a uh, time change. This was supposed to be a little bit later. Um, but to add to my um, pandemic life, I now get to have a root canal and a crown later on this morning. So you see me at the good part of the day um, and probably the last webinar I'll, I'll do for a couple of days. But it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm excited to talk about my favorite thing, which is using visual primary sources with students and teaching visual literacy, which is something I do a lot in my daily life, both as a history professor um, I'm a visual historian, a photo historian, and then also as uh, the director of a big map library. And this is Gus, and this is Racky. So hi. he says hi. Uh, those of you who are homeschooling at home as well as teaching at home uh, well know that life. So here we are. I'm going to share my screen with you in just a second. Uh, my goal today is to share some um, visual literacy exercises that you can bring back into the physical and the virtual classroom with you, especially as we begin to wind down the year, some activities that you can do with your students via Zoom, just like we're doing them today. I'll model that a little bit and maybe something different to kind of start up your day with them if you're doing um, any synchronous learning or even if you're doing any um, asynchronous activities, these actually can work both ways. And they work really well in a physical classroom too. So they're pretty adaptable. I'm gonna share my screen. Joe's gonna monitor the chat. Um, if you have near you a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil, or if that's easily gettable for you, um, I would encourage you to grab that now. A couple of the exercises that we're gonna do together are gonna require you to uh, write a little bit. Um, and just an act of, of modeling some of these things that, that we would do with students and that it's you know not a handout necessarily that you need to make them, but sometimes with a lot of these exercises, it's fine to just say, you know, find a blank piece of paper, find something to write with and, and come sit and, and watch and participate with us. So I'm gonna walk through just a couple of principles of visual literacy, and then we are gonna get into some of this work and, and why it's important. Um, a lot of the classes I teach at USM, um, I'm a main historian as well, have a lot to do um, with training historians, training students, training a lot of future teachers. I got a couple of nice emails from former students this week who were just hired in many of the districts that you guys worked in. So I got some happy emails this week uh, with newly, from newly minted teachers. Um, but I really teach to use, so often um, historians use images as illustration and not as source. So I'm always trying to get people to move beyond that and to read images in the same way that and for the same purposes as we read text. And it takes a lot of practice, um, both for us and with students. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and start sharing some of these visuals. And I can see a bunch of you on the side. So, um, I'm gonna move past that and I'm gonna recommend a couple of different texts. These are things that you can pick up in, uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna say your spare time because I know you don't have any now, um, but some things that have helped me over the years really think about why visuals are so important in the classroom. There is a classic text that came out in 1972, um, by a British, John Berger's many things. He's sort of an art critic, a uh, cultural historian. Um, but he put out a four part series on the BBC called Ways of Seeing. You can actually watch it on YouTube in all four parts. 
And if your students really like stuff from the 70s, then they'll get a big kick out of it because this program is very 70s. Um, but it's called Ways of Seeing. <clears throat> and a book and a companion book um, came out with that as well. And so one of the things that Berger says is, the relation between what we see and what we know is never settled. Each evening we see the sunset, we know that the earth is turning away from it, yet the knowledge and the explanation never quite fit the sight, right? Just because we know something and understand something scientifically doesn't mean the visualization or the experience of seeing something always matches what we understand about it. And the other piece from the book, and it's, there's a lot of um, ways to think about how we see and what we see that comes out of this that I think is important, especially with pre-K and early childhood education, is that seeing comes before words that the child looks and recognizes before the child can speak. And I like to remind people and like to rem remind myself of that sometimes, that long before, long before we can, we can talk, um, many of us can see. And in that seeing, in that recognition, it's kind of matching what we see then to what we know. And so the act of seeing um, tends to come early on in someone's existence. And so if we think about what this means for the classroom, Chuck Close is a really interesting artist. Um, and one of the things I admire about him in his, it's one of his more recent books, it's kind of a mix match where you can turn the different parts of his faces and get different self-portraits of him. But he talked a lot at the beginning about how hard school was for him, how hard K through 12 was for him as a student who was more interested in the arts. And this always serves as a good reminder to me about the different things that our students are capable of and how sometimes when we switch up our techniques in the classroom, um, it can really, bring in students who may not participate in other activities as heavily. And you'll see this sometimes when you start using a lot of visuals or doing a lot of these exercises. You may start to hear from students who you don't hear from as frequently or you more frequently have to bring into the discussion. Um, so Chuck says, there were teachers and mentors all along the way who believed in me. In grade school, I couldn't remember names and dates in history class. So instead, I made a 10 foot long illustrated map of Lewis and Clark's expedition. I put it up on the wall and the teacher realized I wasn't goofing off, but that I was interested in the material and gave me extra credit to make up for my performance on tests and papers. Art was what I did to convince others that I was interested in school. It was what I did to feel good about myself. And I think thinking about how, for many students, those alternative forms of expression can sometimes bring out what they know in ways that writing and reading and, and working with text can't. And so that's just a reminder from, from Chuck Close in that situation. So as you, I, I don't need to tell you, especially lately, I think all I do is see people on a computer screen these days, as many of you do, um, but we live in an incredibly visual world and we're used to looking really fast. And, and one of the things with visual learning and visual literacy and bringing these kind of sources into the classroom is that we need to learn ourselves or to relearn or to remember. And we certainly need to teach some of our younger students who have grown up in this digital, image-laden, fast-paced world to look slowly. And we need lots of practice with this. I, it's, you know, I'll still get notes from students once in a while or like, I teach a class called Photographing American History and I'll teach it in the fall. And one of the things students say, you ruined looking at books or reading the paper for me because now it takes me just as long to look at the picture as it does to read the article. And I say, I win. Um, because that's, that's my goal is that you're gonna take some time to really look at things more slowly. And if you think about the way that we encounter images on Instagram, on Facebook, on a moving screen, on a TV, we're often scrolling. And so if you think about when you scroll through a feed, you do not take a long time to look at things. You might slightly pause to put a reaction on something. You know, Gus tends to call it when I'm looking at Instagram or he wants to see some cat pictures, he'll say, put a heart on it, you know, like it, put a heart on it. So we, may, we might stop quickly enough to kind of 
pause and give something, you know, an extra second or two, but we're looking at things for seconds, you know, before we go on to the next image. And that takes practice to be able to slow down and slowing down is what we really want to do. So when you're thinking about visual literacy with your students at its very like simplest form in the, in the breakdown of the definition, and there are books and books written about visual literacy, it's the ability to understand, to create, and to use visual images. And so I think in the classroom, a lot of what we're doing is we're focused on the understanding and also the using, because in many ways, we can, once we begin to help students understand and pick apart these images, then they can begin to use them as evidence in their, in their own work um, that we're asking them to do. And this is created by um, like the Association of College Research Libraries. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this particular chart, but I like the way that they visualize visual literacy. I think it's important to think about it that way. And they have the concept in the middle. Um, and this is for librarians to think through, but I also think it's really helpful for teachers. Um, if you're defining an image need, then you find the image, you interpret and analyze the image, you evaluate them, you use them, then you might use them to create other images and visual media, and how do we use them ethically as well as cite them. And so when you start looking for images that might work in your classroom, right? What is your image need? What do you want to do with this? What do you want students to be able to accomplish? How are you going to find them? And then how are you going to help them to interpret and analyze and evaluate them? And I think we really live on that, you know, right-hand curve of, of the circular, um, the visual literacy array is what that particular infographic is. Um, and so we're, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. So something to keep in the back of your head, and I have to constantly remind myself of this, and my students also do a nice job of reminding me of this just in their daily discussions, <laughs> that when students look at an image, when you choose an image for everyone in the class to look at, they do not all see the same thing, right? They don't. They, they perceive it differently. Um, and how that perception happens, like how that visual message is delivered, comes through differently, right? It's filtered through age, it's filtered through gender, race, past experiences, um, culture, socioeconomics, sometimes religious orientation, but it can even be filtered through mood, right? How you're feeling on any given day, if you're in a good mood, if you're in a bad mood, if you're tired, right? If you're particularly alert, it can impact the way that you see and experience and perceive an image. And I think that's important. And then I think you also have to think about um, in terms of ADA and, and others, you know, do you have students in the classroom who are visually impaired, who are not seeing as well? How would you modify this kind of activity for them in the same way that you might modify a video by putting on closed captioning how would you describe an image to someone? Where would you seat someone if they need to see it better? Um, how would you modify this activity? It's just something to think about as we're thinking about seeing. So as kids develop, they see objects, they see shapes, and then they begin to get concepts and relationships from images. Think about those early board books that you use with kids, shapes, textures, apple, banana, farm animals, tractors, trucks, all the things, the relationships that kids discern early on from these very simple concept things. And when we should start simple and kind of move more complex. Um, many of you maybe um, have been introduced to the concept of um, visual thinking strategies. And if you have reactions down um, on the bottom of your screen, can you give me a thumbs up or a wave if you've used visual thinking strategies before? Just so I can get a sense. Yeah, so some people, a few. Um, I'll explain it a little bit um, as, we, as we go forward with that. So visual thinking strategies has been in play for a couple of decades now. Um, 
And it's just a way to get kids talking about images. And honestly, it's a way to get anybody talking about images. Even our nursing school at USM are heavy users of VTS to train nurses and, and also medical schools use it to train physicians to look closely and to really make specific detailed observations and to get better at doing that in a group session. So visual thinking strategy just is based on three different questions. And it has a home website, vtshome.org. You can see lots of videos of this strategy in action with kids as young as three or four and high school kids as well. And the visual thinking strategies is really based around three questions, just three. And I would, we use it a little bit differently in, in history and I'll, I'll make some points about that in a second. But there are three questions that are asked by the facilitator, most often the teacher, but students are really good at doing this with one another, by the way, in small groups once you teach them the questions. So they do a very nice job of leading visual thinking strategies with each other once they know the questions. And the first one is what's going on in this picture? What do you see that makes you say that? And then what else can you find? And so you select an image, and I'll give you an, we'll do this together in a second. And you facilitate with these three questions. What's going on in this picture? So kids, you really, with VTS, you should encourage a free flowing conversation. If you have to do hand raising to mediate, it's fine. If you can get away with not doing it, it's even preferable in VTS. You don't want them all shouting over one another, but you'll be surprised that they will, once they get the hang of this, be pretty eager to answer um, what's going on in this picture. And it's what they think is going on. And I make this distinction, especially with social studies teachers, because often when we pick an image that's, that we're using to help visualize a time period, there's a right answer to what's going on in the picture. But I would tell you with visual thinking strategies, there's not supposed to be a right answer to what's going on in this picture. It's about what students observe, and it's about them being able to give you the evidence that underlies that. So the what do you see that makes you say that is about them being able to say, well, I think, you know, this is a teacher at the front of the room teaching students because, you know, and then you'd say, what do you see that makes you say that? I see a chalkboard. Right, I see someone writing, I see someone with a pointer, right? You, they have to be able to give you this evidence in the picture. And then you're constantly asking, what else can you find? What else can you see? And so it becomes this conversation with you, the students, but it's particularly a conversation between the students and the image. Um, and the more we do this, like any visual exercise, the better we get. So I'm going to do this with this picture. I'm going to ask you to unmute um, when you want to answer. Hopefully we won't have too much feedback. Zoom, we'll see Zoom's limitations on this right now. But I want you to see this particular picture. So we're going to do a visual thinking strategy warm up um, with this image. So I'm going to ask first the question, what's going on in this picture. And you're more than welcome to just jump in and, and answer. What's going on in this picture? Young girl all by herself with a row of houses behind her or, or dwellings. So that's what you're seeing. So what else is going on in this picture? It looks like she's hiding something behind her back. So she may be hiding something behind her back. What else is going on in this picture? Is it ocean in the background? What do you what see do you that see makes you say that? It appears to be a body of water at the end of this road. So we see a body of water. We see a young girl. What else is going on in this picture? It looks like maybe she's either talking to or having some kind of an interaction with the photographer. She looks puzzled or concerned. So her facial expression is standing out to you. She may be trying to hide her eyes from the sun. What makes you say that? Well, she's, she looks like she's squinting a bit. 
Nice. What else can we find? What else do you see in this picture? Her clothing looks, it might maybe be homemade. What makes you say that? Uh, just the way the pattern of the skirt and the top match and they're kind of, they look like they're sewn together. What else can we find in the picture? Uh, there's grass, so I'm just assuming it's not winter. Yeah, so there's grass. You're not seeing any particular snow. What else do people see? It looks like uh, maybe one of the cabins is boarded up, but the window is also open. Um, what makes you think that it's boarded up? What makes you say that? What do you see? Where? Um, the second one back, it looks like the plank is like over the door frame instead of inset in the door frame. So it looks like you might not be able to open it unless it opens out. But the one closest to us opens inward, it looks like. Interesting. But the window is still open, so. It's hard, it's hard to see, but there are, some of the doors appear to have that there are things leaning against them. Mm -hmm. So if you go, start at the water and go up to one, two, three house, you know, what is that? I can't make that out. And then mm -hmm. the house that this late, uh, that we said before that was boarded up, there's, there's stuff on that porch. I just can't make it out. Mm -hmm. so, so, looks so like, there, looks like there might be a chair on a chair or someplace to sit on the second house in. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what's going on in this picture? Somebody's taking her picture. <laughs> why? and the question is why right <laughs> the question is why it is and you can see so i'm going to have you mute again so we lose the lose the feedback so you see with vts if you were doing this with a bunch of students either on zoom or, or in a classroom you would really push them to do this kind of a lot and and you might um the idea that you would say to to them is that you know this is very low stakes i want to hear from everyone Right, because they're all going to have an opinion about what's going on in the picture. And it's really about encouraging them to share their thoughts in a group. And the more VTS you do, the better they get at just sharing and talking in general. Because it's low stakes, they can get a comfort in speaking in front of their peers, which you know, you know, begins to turn off for a lot of students, some in middle school, some in high school, some even earlier. Um, the younger students <laughs> don't seem to have as much of a problem openly sharing what they think about something when you ask them. When I do this with second graders and third graders, it's like a cacophony. When I do this with college students at first, it's like crickets, right? I don't want to say something that, you know, is going to make me look silly, right? Or, or I don't know what's going on, but I think this, maybe somebody else, the more you do it, the better they get. So, one of the things that I often do, I have colleagues who start off class by open by, you know, playing a song that's related to something that they're studying um, and discussing that. But I often start every class with a visual warm up. Right. I mean, depending on what I'm teaching on any given day, I might choose an image. It might be a painting. It might be a map. It might be a photograph. It might be a poster or an ad and just do a warm up. So this is one a visual thinking strategy exercise is one warm up you can do with students. And you can do it for 10 15 minutes um, on the same image and then kind of get them thinking about that and then launch into whatever you're doing for the day. It sometimes is a nice in the same way that sometimes people do pre-writing. It's it's it's, it's a neat form of pre-teaching. So you get them thinking about a concept you're going to teach about today, but they have to see it before they even know the concept. So it's important with VTS that you don't give any identifying information about the image before you do the exercise. Because I'm a historian, like I always want to know what it is after. <laughs> That's not really the point of VTS. When they do it in art galleries and stuff, they don't often spend a long time on the artist and the history of it. But for you all, I will tell you um, what this is. So you don't reveal the title, the caption, or the context until after you've done the exercise. It's not about getting a right answer. It's about getting comfortable with seeing and discussing images. So Lewis Hine took this in Eastport, Maine in 1911. He worked for the National Child Labor Commission. 
Um, and so when you see the caption, it changes things. Elsie Shaw, a six-year-old cartoner during the summer at Seacoast Canning Company, factory number two. Her father is boss of the cutting room in factory number one. He asked me to take some photos of her as he has her do a singing act in vaudeville in the winter. And she's old enough now to go through the audience and sell her own photos. And so this context gives a lot of different information to this photo. Who's taking it, why it was taken. So Lewis Hines working for the National Child Labor Commission, trying to uh, visualize child labor so that the United States government will pass acts against child labor because the argument of the NCLC is six-year-olds should not be in um, sardine canning factories, that they should be in school. Um, and so trying to visually convince and to move an audience. Um, and Lewis Hine wrote really interesting captions as a social photographer, often based on interviews with people. And so you get a lot of information um, that, you know, that this photo might be then used for the girl to walk around after the vaudeville show and sell the picture and autograph it. Even at six, you know, it's like a first grader. So you have to imagine that kind of work. And those discussions can can take you a long time, you know, through things, depending on how long you wanna you wanna spend on the stuff as you're moving along in your class. But it, they're nice warm ups. We can do this um, as well with with photographs as we can do with maps and other images. Um, and for something like this, I again wouldn't necessarily tell students when it's from but I might pull a map out like this when I'm talking about Western expansion and the transcontinental railroad. Um, and instead of what's going on in this picture, I might say something like what's going on in this map. Um, so I might say to you and anyone can unmute if you like, what's going on in this map? Certain things are outlined. Like I yeah. see text is outlined and I see an unusual shape in the whole left hand upper quadrant. There is an unusual, so there's unusual shapes. Certain things are outlined. What else do you see? What is going on on this map? It looks like maybe like some rivers or something is outlined on there. Yeah, what do you see that makes you think that it's rivers? Because of the way they branch out. Nice. What else can we find? What other people see? All the little pictures, the small pictures around the border. And then there's some text at the bottom. Um, and it says it's the Union Pacific Railway to all points west. So probably those little pictures are in the west. And maybe they're there because people haven't seen those places. I mean, the map looks old too, so. It does look old. What makes you, what makes you say that it looks old? The staining up there and the, the font. Well, I would use the word font, but the type of print that's on it and the black and white photos maybe, um, the pale colors. So there's a way to kind of get people thinking about the object itself too, with the image and sort of what it, what it is, right? So this is, you're saying like, this is some sort of, it's a map, but it's older. And here's how we might know that. What more can we find? What other people see in going on in this map? It reminds me of those placemats, paper placemats you get at mm -hmm. diners with advertisements on the side. Yeah. It, it does. What, it makes you say that because of the little squares around it. Right. This may be a this may be a tour, a or a travel promotional. So that makes you think it's promotional. Perhaps. Interesting. What else do people see? Anything else you want to point out? Maine is cut off. <laughs> <laughs> aren't, aren't we always? <laughs> Well, when you say that, I mean, it does say it's, it's to all points west. So that makes me think that that darker line might be the actual railway that is going west. Like maybe 
maybe there's rail to the east too that's not shown on the map and that's the railway that's going west. Maybe that's newer or something at that time. Yeah, so this is definitely a map about westward expansion from 1878. Um, I will show you the little, this is from the collections at the Osher Map Library. It's really big. So one of the things that you have to be careful of when you're doing visual thinking with students and also when you're doing this next exercise that we'll do together, which is a little different than BTS with the three questions, is that when you can, you want to tell them how big it is because everything appears the same size on a screen. So that little Lewis Hine photo I showed you looks like the same size of this map that is essentially almost as big as like a picture window. It's huge. It's like seven feet wide. Um, and so sometimes the size can help with people and, and with clues. So here's what this is. New map of the Union Pacific Railway, the short, quick and safe line to all points west. Uh, was published by Rand McNally. Um, and then it's a wall map. So only the Union Pacific Railroad Company could use this map. It wasn't one that people could buy. And it was the map that was posted in stations. So you could look at the line and know where you were going and know what the stops were. Like those maps sometimes you see in the T stations or in undergrounds or things somewhere, you can kind of plot out your trip from the station. And so it's very ephemeral. We don't know of many other of these besides the one in our collection. There certainly are others that exist, but this is something that would have been taken off the station wall um, and put on it. It's very graphic. That's why you see the big red piece, um, the red piece on it too. So it's interesting to see um, what that is and what it does. And those vignettes, you were right. Those of you who are talking about those with tourism and travel, it is to get people excited about going west. It is to get people to think about what's out there, what they might see. They are promotional in a way, right? They're trying to convince people to ride the railroad. And so you might choose an image like that to talk, you know, when you're talking about travel and transportation with students uh, and to get them to think about how that was advertised or how that was used across time. Um, the second exercise I want to do with you is probably a more common one than VTS in a social studies classroom. So VTS is a nice warm up visual thinking strategies. It's a nice way to teach this to students. It's a nice way to emphasize low stakes participation and looking and, and practicing evidence. Um, this one is a little bit more specific to what the image really is. So if you have your pen and paper, um, that's what I'm going to have you do for this one. And I'm also going to um, grab my phone because I'm going to use, I'm going to use a timer on this one. So this is an exercise where you set a timer for two minutes. Um, and initially, like two minutes is not a very long time. Two minutes when you first do this exercise with students seems like an eternity to them. You're like, wait, you want me to look at the same thing for two minutes? Yes, yes I do. Usually look at things for one second, we're gonna look at this for two minutes together. And so you instruct them and you say, okay, we're gonna look at this for two minutes. And then the first thing you're gonna do, and, and this is all we're gonna do for two minutes and then we're gonna do the second part of the thing. We're gonna look at the whole photograph and then either in your head, you can do this, with students looking at the same image on a board, or I, I would do this for exams and stuff too, back when I used to give those. Um, I would print out photographs on paper and have them do it with it in front of you. And for some students, uh, particularly if you're dealing with any um, visual challenges, if people need to see something up closer, that's sometimes a nice accommodation where they could be looking at it on the screen, but also have a printed out copy in front of them. Um, and so you look at the whole image at first, and then either in your mind or on paper, you, you divide the photograph into quadrants, into four zones, and you look at each of the four zones to see what else you see. So all we're gonna do for this two minutes, which I am about to set on my clock, you are gonna take your piece of paper and your pen or pencil, and you are going to list as many things as you can see in this photograph. We are observing, we're not analyzing, we're not judging, we're not drawing conclusions. I want you to list every detail, everything 
thing that you can see. Are we ready? Okay, there's the photo and go. You are being timed. List everything you can possibly see. You have one minute left. If you haven't done quadrants yet, you might try that. about 15 seconds to make any last observations. And time. Okay, so how many, I'm curious, um, and you can put this in the chat. Um, how many things did you find? How many items did you list? And you will find that for students that this can vary pretty significantly. What one person sees in two minutes and what, so some students may have five or 10 things. You might have students and other people who have 20 or 30 different items that they can list. And so one of the things that you can do um, with activities yeah you guys saw a lot um one of the things you can do with this activity is at any point in this activity you can share out so it's a three-part activity that was part one so you might have a big discussion i'll often do this if i'm doing this for a warm-up at this point i'll say okay let's just call out everything we see and i'll make a giant list on a board or you can make a giant list on a google doc if you were doing this remotely with students and they'll see, and you'll start to hear people say, oh, I didn't see that, where's that? You know, doing this exercise with students with one image can take 25 to 30 minutes. That's one thing I would warn you about these. You can do them as quick warm up exercises, but you also might wanna leave time for the significant chunk of time that this can take. And I would argue that it's time well spent because this is more about learning a skill than it is about learning the content. You tie it into your content by picking images that go along with what you're trying to teach um, and what you're trying to cover that day. But the skill is really to observe and, and look. And the more I do this with students, the better everything they do is, particularly their short essay writing um, and primary source reflections. So the first stage is just what you did. You list everything. They can pair and share at this point or you can share out as a class. And then you would ask them, who do you think made the photograph and why? What purpose does it serve? And they can think about that and you can talk about that. And then the key part to me and the part that I reinforce again and again and again with students is, okay, now that you've made all these observations, what you see, now that you thought about What's the context? Who made it? Why? For what reason? Um, now you can draw conclusions. Now you can tell me what you think is going on in this picture. So maybe list three conclusions about what's going on in the picture. 
So if you had to draw conclusions from what you observed based on this picture, who wants to chime in and tell me what they think it is? What conclusions would you draw after listing everything out? They're all gathering hay. Yeah, so there's some sort of hay gathering process going on, absolutely. Some sort of harvest. It looks like the boys and the men are doing the haying and the woman is watching, um, at least at the moment of the photo. Yeah, so there's maybe some gender differentiation that someone can look at. There's a young woman in the bottom corner watching the boys and the men do this particular sort of physical labor. Any other conclusions that anyone would come to? You want to venture a guess on where, when, why, any of those things? Yeah, Charles. I noticed a big wheel on the wagon. And I think that might be something in preparing the hay for the farmers, it, um, maybe a primitive baler of some kind. A baler so of some not sort. Only going out to, to pick up, they're not only going out to get the hay, but they also prepare it to be shipped or sell it perhaps. Yeah, there's some sort of processing. When would you place this in time, if you had to guess? Well, I put it near the beginning of the day because those wagons are empty. <laughs> oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. it's about what they've actually yeah. processed. That's a really good observation. And the dog has a collar. So the dog is more, I think, of a pet than a working dog. Hmm. People see details that, like, I've never even looked at the dog's collar. You know, you see all different kinds of details. It looks like the, the wagon might be meant to be horse-drawn. So maybe they were still using horses, even if they had some types of machinery. And, and the, that... Cynthia, it, therein lies the point of this whole image, which I will tell you what its title is now. Oh, so it's by Shantanetta Stanley Emmons. This is a main photograph. It's from about 1910. Uh, it's up in like the Kingfield area of Maine, Western Maine. And the title of the photograph that she titled it, it's called The Coming of Mechanization. Oh. And so it is about this tension in Maine's history about, I, in teaching Maine history, I always see this, just because you get a new process or a new fangled invention doesn't mean that Mainers are going to put it in place till they need to. And you <laughs> often see old processes and modern processes coexisting side by side in Maine for a lot longer than you see them in other, even other parts of New England. So this is about that tension between the hand, you know, the hand draw, the, the cutting and the bailing, and also what the machine baler can do, which is what's ahead of it. So you get a machine that can make the bales, and then what about the wagon and the other, the turning that can make the bales too. So it's interesting. And that's the photographer's daughter, by the way, in her dog at the bottom corner. She often puts um, Dorothea in there uh, for Whoa. context. So there's a lot going on in the image and a lot that, that students can discuss. And, and in that one, the more you can differentiate in any primary source work with students, whether you're doing text or images, and I find it easier in images, is that not to jump to conclusions, right? We see things and we say, okay, there's a girl and her dog in the hay, the farmers are bailing, end of story, it kind of leaves out any room for possibilities. That's why we have to slow down and look at what we really see, the tree, the sky. I have taught this photograph, I have published this photograph, I've used this photograph so many times. And even today I noticed something different that I'd never seen before. And I wonder if it's because everybody is making all of these gardens now that I see them using um, the packing wow. crate bottoms, the pallets. And so I noticed in the left-hand side of this image kind of events against the fence are a lot of pallets. And so that made me wonder, you know, what's going on with those pallets? And I'll have to think more about that later. Um, and you can look at the expressions. You can count how many people. Um, are the kids actually doing any work? Some are, some aren't. You know, are they along for the ride? And it can lead you in a lot of different places for discussion. And so that's, that exercise is a little bit different. You know, the two minutes, you are trying to get them to place an image in time. Right, you are trying to get them to figure out what's going on, why did the photographer take it, and to use observations and then to draw conclusions. Observe first, analyze and draw conclusions second. 
right? And if you can teach that pattern, it's going to begin to appear in more and more of their work, which is so important in all kinds of social studies that you're, that you're teaching. So I want to be mindful um, of, the, of our time this morning. And, and one of the other set of visual analysis strategies comes from the National Museum of Art at Duke. It's not a particular exercise, but I like the reinforcement of this one with students. Look long, look close, look again, look critically, look thoughtfully. That's what visual thinking strategy is asking you to do this too. What more can we find? Look and then look again. And I think that looking again is really important for students as we're, as we're trying to model this work. It's even more important when you try to do this with infographics, and we won't do this one collectively. But think about the complex graphics that you give to students or that you illustrate one of your own lectures with. This is from 1968. It's a civics thing that would have hung in a classroom. It's spotlight on the 1968 elections. It, there is so much information in this one graphic. <laughs> political symbols, candidates for the presidency, Congress since World War II, congressional lineup, who serves what state, what has a Democratic governor, what has a Republican governor, what are the state populations, what are the electoral votes. The White House map kills me, like it specifically points out the movie theater and the swimming pool and gymnasium if you look like underneath Texas. Um, if you were really to understand what this image was about, you would need like 20, 30 minutes to unpack it, mm -hmm. truly. And, and I think that of maybe more than any point that I'll make this morning is important. Like these take time. If you would give students 10 or 15 minutes to read a passage of text, then you need to give them 10 minutes to read images as well once you are kind of teaching them some of these techniques. One of my favorite, this is another thing you can have older students do, once they get good at using them, you can send them to find them. So you might say, we're doing the 1920s this week. We're doing the Great Depression this week. I want you to go on this website, right? So you pick the primary source place. Library of Congress prints and photographs is a favorite for me. This is Duke's ad access. All you have to do is Google ad access Duke and you'll come to this. There's 7,000 advertisements ranging from about the 19 teens to the 1950s on here. And when I teach the 20s, one of the visual assignments I have my students do is, go, I want you to look at any 10 ads you want. I want you to choose one of these ads and bring it back to analyze together collectively, right? So give them some choice in, in the choosing of the ad. The copy on the 1920s ones are unbelievable if you want to have any discussions about gender role, makeup, credit, image. Uh, the tagline on this, uh, most men ask, is she pretty, not is she clever? That's the leading tagline from this 1924 ad for soap. Um, what does that mean, right? How have we begin to, you know, how do we begin to unpack this? So I would also give a plug for using advertisements, both past and present in doing um, this kind of work with students. And so one of the things that I would also ask you to think about is that do images illustrate or does the image tell the story? And how does the pairing of image with text change the way we see the text and change the way we understand the image, which is another important question in asking this. And there are some good exercises that people can go through um, with this as well. I want to make mm -hmm. um, one more point with that too, um, which I'm going to go to this. So never forget that prior learning and knowledge kind of inform our perception of new images. So I'm just going to show you a quick series of photographs and I'm going to ask you what historical era they are from. So. Question. Yeah, that's well. So you immediately nice see nice. these and you say Great Depression. One, because you may recognize the image, but why else? So why 
why do these stand out so distinctly as 1930s and 1940s America? The clothing, and we know about the Dust Bowl, and we know about the, the economic hardships, and we know some of those photos that were taken to show people who weren't there what was happening there. And you know them because the government did a major photo mm -hmm. project to do exactly that. Yeah. But we tend to think about the 1930s in black and white, and it's dangerous to think about the past in black and white, because yeah. it was lived in color. <laughs> but these documentary photographs from the 30s make us think, it makes, the, it makes it look more stark. I'm not saying the Depression wasn't bad. It was bad, right? It was tough for a lot of people. But what happens when you start to look at the same images taken by the same photographers using color film instead of black and white? Yeah. They look totally changes it. They look a little different. Yeah. And maybe if I showed these first, you wouldn't have immediately said, Oh, these are from the Great Depression in the same way. Because mm -hmm. they're not that stark black and white. And so I would just point out the Library of Congress where they hold the full collection of the Farm Security Administration photographs has a separate collection for the black and white ones and a separate collection for the color ones. And mm -hmm. I would definitely encourage you to use the color ones as well, just to remind students that, you know, life is lived in color in this way, right? That we can, we can see these things together. And whether something is in black and white and whether it's in color can often affect how we feel about it. It can manipulate us a little bit. It can change our perception. So Joshua Brown, who's a visual historian, he works on newspaper images mostly. But he reminds us that when historians look at photographs, we see things differently from other disciplines. And so we look into evidence, how things are linked. Um, but he makes this argument, which I really take to heart in my teaching at the bottom, that a lot of people aren't informing their historical scholarship with images. Historians must be willing to treat photographs and other archival visual evidence with the same seriousness and rigor that they apply to text. Until they recognize photographs as a legitimate resource, the value of historical inquiry will never be adequately tested or fully realized. And that starts in the K through 12 classroom. If we don't privilege this work, if we don't treat images the same as we treat text as really important, really useful primary source materials that we give our students, then we're not going to see a change in the field because students are just going to think history and text. And they do. They often think history, text, map, chart, graph, instead of thinking of this. And I love text. Don't get me wrong. Like I assign a lot of text. This is not saying throw everything out and, you know, use the image instead, but it's to give, you know, a little bit more attention to the images um, and, and to students practicing analyzing them, which is the hard work of it and takes a lot of time, but they have a lot to say about it. Often a lot more to say than they do when they're reading a text. Um, I'm going to stop my screen so I can see everybody uh, in front of me. And I would love to chat and answer um, any questions that anyone might have about how they would use this um, or what you would do or anything in general. Uh, so there's talk about how to analyze articles and discover if the information is kind of like misleading and whatnot, I know there's been a lot of like editing of photographs. Are there similar skills you can equip students with to help identify if an image is, is real or not? That's a great, that's a really great question. And that has a lot to do with the time period something comes with. So when I teach photographing American history, people tend to think that only more contemporary images have the power to be edited and manipulated and and we think of something being photoshopped quite a bit, right? Um, but they were doing that kind of editing almost since the dawn of photography, you know, scratching out things on negatives. Um, Alexander Gardner very famously moved the body at Gettysburg 
um, of the kind of um, drag from one place to another, the sharpshooter, that very famous photograph. Um, it's the same kind of, the same evidentiary based questions about context, I think are as important with images. Who made it? Where and when was it made? And why was it made? And I think, especially with looking at photographs, that why is really important because we often take photos to use as illustrations as historians when we're trying to illustrate a concept that would have been used entirely in a different fashion. Just look at that image of the little girl. The dad wanted the photo taken for a vaudeville headshot that she could sell in the crowd. Lewis Hine is taking that same image back to the National Child Labor Commission to say we should be outlawing child labor. And so I think so much of that, Neil, it's a really good question. I think so much of it is how was it used when it was first created? And how is it being used now? Is someone manipulating the use of the image for a different um, purpose? And with, with context, with photos, you've always got to ask students to think about what's outside the frame. We only see what was in the frame of the photo. So I could zoom in on any one of you or any little part of your house or any, anything and, and take an image to represent a specific thing, but what's in the rest of the frame. And I think that is often a, a key way to do it. In a digital age, it's really hard to do that without the underlying metadata um, in terms of, we do know, like with digital images, we do know when they were manipulated and created because the literal, the literal like zeros and ones stored inside the image tell us that, what kind of camera it came from, when it was taken, and all of that stuff. We don't often have access to that, but when people are doing like forensic photo research for crime scenes and things like that, the image itself will provide a lot of that data and with if it was corrupted or not. So there are ways to tell, but it's harder. Sweet, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? I know we're running close on time and everyone probably has to get back to their teaching day and their homeschooling day. <laughs> Joe's back in the corner. I was just gonna encourage everybody to once again, that this is their opportunity with the expert in the room if they have a question. I, I do wanna talk a little bit about like, how do you balance the child who has a lot to say all the time and the child who has a hard time or little more shy and if you do it over and over again like what strategies do you build in for trying to help balance the contributions from the different kids i think that's where the visual thinking strategy really comes in mm -hmm. i think that's where vts is more effective than any other of these exercises in doing that yes you can i'll come in and get you i think that um exercises because you can say all right, I want to hear from everyone. We're not going to move on to the next image. We're not going to do something yeah. until we move on until we hear from everyone. And because it's so rapid fire, it's like a game. It's kind of fun yeah. once they get into it. Um, and then I'll usually have them do that in smaller groups. And it's really in those smaller groups. I, I hated group work as a student because like the on task nature of that, like you can never predict. But VTS works really well in a group because you're like, take five minutes and VTS this image and everybody has to participate equally because it's not based on pre-reading. It's not based on who did the homework and who didn't. It's based on what they see at that moment, at that time in that exercise. And I think that's something that really helps. Um, and I do think you will hear more voices pipe up and it's important to other students to hear the other ones because then they say, oh, well that person never talks, but they're talking now. They actually have something to say. Um, so it's less about you waiting once they do it enough, you waiting to fill up time and space while you're just like hearing silence while you're waiting for someone else other than the kid that always raises their hand. Yeah. Um, because it's rapid fire and if you can get away with not hand raising, I think you'll eradicate some of that. And when you use it in a group, do you have one student be the facilitator or do they just all participate? Okay. I have one student be the facilitator and they can take turns. Like you could have a group of four people and a packet of four images 
and they oh, can, okay, yeah. And they yeah. can each do one. I find yeah. that that often works. Great with World War One posters. World War Two posters will work really well with VTS, um, mm -hmm. and they can get a lot out of them um, yeah. like that. But I think of all of the different techniques, the VTS is the one that will get the most people talking, and okay. some people. Um, it engages them even if they find other things boring. Like they might find this less boring. <laughs> okay, yep. I'm not saying it's the magical solution, but it does, there's a lot of engagement that goes yeah. on. Yeah. Any last questions for Libby to get on the record? Everything else is just gonna be off the record. Do you have a few favorite Civil War things, like for oh, middle I, school age, say? I do. Um, Harper's Weekly illustrations, like Winslow Homer's Harper's Weekly illustration or Thomas Nass cartoons okay. from that era and Harper's Weekly are great things to analyze from the Civil War. And then there's a wonderful collection at the Library of Congress, uh, prints and photographs page of Civil War photographs taken by Matthew Brady and others. Yeah. And, um, they're not of battles because the technology wasn't there to capture the action, mm -hmm. but there's some wonderful scenes of camp life okay. and like what the men were doing outside of that. And there's also some excellent hospital pictures of women's roles and things like that. Okay, cool. Those are some of my favorite Civil War things. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Joe. It's wonderful. Any last questions for Libby? Well, Libby, I will give you the formal Thank you from everybody.